Welcome to Bono Schulz, an artist, a murder, and the hijacking of history in our series, Flight or Fight, Stories of Artists Under Repression. I'm Rachel Stern, Executive Director of the Fritz Usher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art based in New York. Today, I'm honored to introduce Benjamin Bailind, a writer living in Jerusalem, who is the author, most recently, of Bruno Schulz, an artist, a murder, and the hijacking of history. The book won this year's National Jewish Book Award in Biography and was named a New York Times Book Re Review Editor's Choice. His previous book, Kafka's Last Trial, awarded the 2020 Samirua Prize, has recently been published in an updated German edition by S. Fischer Verlag. The event will be moderated by Ori Scholtes, who teaches at Georgetown University across a range of disciplines from art history and theology to philosophy and political history. He's the former director and curator of the Bnebrit Klutznik National Jewish Museum and has curated more than 90 exhibitions there and in other venues across the country and overseas. He's also the author of over 280 books, articles, exhibition catalogs, and essays on diverse topics. Among his books are Fixing the World, Jewish American Painters in the 20th Century, um, The Ashen Rainbow, Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust, and Tradition and Tran Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture. After the presentation, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions. Welcome, Benjamin and Ori. Without further ado, I'll give over to Ori. Thank you, Rachel, and welcome, Benjamin. And I have to say, referring to this book as a biography does it poor service. It's a good deal more than that. It's a, <clears throat> I have to say, reading it, I felt a little bit like I was reading Bruno Schultz. Uh, the style is more than than felicitous and its flow and the way it goes back and forth in different directions, I really appreciate it. The idea of different directions um, seems so endemic to Bruno Schultz. And I, I think back 2000 years to St. Paul of all people, because he has he's someone you can't understand unless you understand that he had three distinct and yet interwoven identities. He was a Judean, of course. And early on, he was a Judean against Jesus. And eventually, of course, he became a Judean for Jesus and, and then became one of the moving forces in turning that form of Judaism into Christianity. But he was also a Hellene. He was a Greek. And what he was and what he thought and what he said and what he did reflected aspects of Greek culture. And he, and he was a Roman citizen. And that also was reflected in each of those aspects of him had elements of what we are and how we are different from others. And my mind fast forwarded, I know you may find this strange, Benjamin, but my mind fast forwarded from Paul to Picasso, because then I think of, of Picasso as someone with multiple identities, in that he liked to pretend and wanted people to believe that he was a Catalonia, that he was a Catalan. Of course he wasn't, he was, he was a Spaniard, but he spent a lot of his youth in Barcelona hanging out in El Gatricat Cafe and a lot of his buddies were Catalonian artists. And so he saw himself in a certain sense as independent of, Fran uh, of, excuse me, of Spain, but then ultimately, of course, went to France. And through most of his career, if you looked him up in, a, in an art library, he was listed as a French artist, not just because he was part of the Ecole de Paris, because plenty of people were, but as long as Franco was in power, he didn't want to be associated with Spain. And I had the distinct experience not long after Franco's death, looking for Picasso, and he wasn't where I expected to find him. And the art librarian said, oh, no, he's been switched to Spanish now. So multiple identities. And of course, on top of that, as an artist, he was renowned for all the different directions that he took in making visual art from pottery to sculpture to painting to drawing and so on and so forth. In a certain sense, of course, Bruno Schultz is, is both St. Paul and Picasso in that his identity is on the one hand Ukrainian, on the other hand Polish, on the third hand Jewish. The world which was his 
village in which he spent most of his life was a world which went from being Ukrainian to being Polish, that at certain time was dominated by a Jewish population that became part of the Soviet Union that was swallowed up by the swallowed up by the Nazi machine. And by the way, he was no stranger to German as a as a youth. He was reading Thomas Mann, Budenbrooks, and uh, Joseph and his brothers in German and corresponded with Thomas Mann, as I don't have to tell you because you wrote it. You wrote about that. Um, so multiple identities, in a sense, fuse and interweave in, in what he was and what he became. And then his output, on the other hand, even in a certain sense, more diverse than Picasso's in that Picasso was endlessly diverse in the realm of visual arts. But I first encountered Bruno Schultz back in the 70s, I think, when I stumbled upon Street of the Crocodiles in that, uh, that thin, thin volume, in that series that Philip Roth was editing called The Other Europe, part of an effort to try and introduce the West to Central and Eastern European writers about which about whom we knew not. And I was astonished and blown away, blown away by his writing. And subsequently, of course, I encountered other works by him and realized, wow, this guy is an incredibly brilliant writer. You know, he reminds me a little bit of Kafka almost, except Kafka's different and Schultz is different. What makes Kafka so extraordinary is not necessarily per se his style, whereas Schultz's style, in addition to whatever the content is, is unique. And I had no idea that he was a visual artist in the first place, and only almost by default a writer, and that he'd been an art teacher. Of course, an art teacher who, as you point out in your book, would tell stories to his art students sometimes, as opposed to giving them instruction, and inspire them in a very different oblique kind of manner. And for me, Schultz was someone who just remained in the back of my head, of course, until about the year 2001, when those extraordinary paintings in the walls, on the walls of the Villando, were uncovered by this group of intrepid Schultz fans of diverse identities, each interestingly from his, her, their own perspective need to get to them, finding them beneath the, 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 the paint of, of what had become a storeroom in what had become a, a, an apartment for this elderly and ailing Ukrainian couple. And of course, from there comes controversy. What I had known in between reading him and reading about his writing and finding about his visual art and finding about the finding of his visual art in that particular sort was he'd been gunned down in, in daylight in his own town and the circumstances I knew something about, but I'm not gonna say anything about that because I'm gonna leave you to talk about that. What I'd like to do in fact is start by asking you Benjamin, a very simple and obvious question. What drew you to this topic, which you have dealt with so splendidly? That's my first question. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that fantastic uh framing introduction, Ori. Thank you, Rachel, for inviting me. Thank you to the Fritz Asher Society, and thanks to all of you who have been tuning in. I uh, I came to Schultz in several ways. Uh, first, I have um, my own uh, maternal grandparents are from that part of the world, <clears throat> and I've always been attuned to um, Galicia as the easternmost province of the uh, <clears throat> Austro-Hungarian Empire was known. Um, I'd always been attuned to the uh, multi-ethnic uh, polyglot nature of that society. <clears throat> I was always aware too that there was something in the air of fermentation in those years, a fermentation and decay, you might say, that Franz Kafka sensed in his part of that empire in Prague. Uh, within a very small geographical radius, you have in the same basic year as Bruno Schulz writing in Polish, Shai Agnon writing in Hebrew, Josef Roth writing in German. I think all of them are sensing this Galician uh, 
the fermentation, the creative fermentation of decay. <clears throat> so there's the family connection. The second is that uh, I was uh, writing about the cultural conundrums of where Franz Kafka's manuscripts, original manuscripts belong. I followed that trial for years through, as it wound its way up through the Israeli courts to all the way to the uh, <clears throat> Supreme Court here in Jerusalem. And I was aware of uh, these competing, uh, how competing nationalisms can affect the question of artistic belonging how cultural artifacts, whether they be paintings or whether they be manuscripts, the accents fall differently based on where those uh, artifacts are geographically. I was always interested in that. Uh, I was interested in Bruno Schulz and his fiance being Josefina Zelenska, being the first translators of Franz Kafka's The Trial into Polish. And later we'll mention uh, Schultz's marvelous um, essay on that occasion. Uh, <clears throat> so it was almost um, overdetermined. And and um, when I was in Poland, people would refer to Bruno Schultz as the Polish Kafka, despite the obvious stylistic differences that you alluded to. Uh, I became intrigued uh, in that. And then I became intrigued in the place of... Um, uh, of Jerusalem, where I happen to live, in these stories of belonging, which is to say uh, how, in both the case of Franz Kafka and the case of Bruno Schulz, as we'll as we'll talk about at some length, um, somehow Jerusalem saw itself, despite everything, as the proper place of belonging. I call what happened to the murals of Bruno Schulz a kind of forced aliyah. There are many layers of coercion in this story. But yes. the last, I think, is the coercion of bringing these fragments to the uh, Yad Vashem uh, Holocaust Museum here. And the question is, why? What was the insistence of these national bodies in Jerusalem? Namely, the National Library of Israel insisting that Kafka's manuscripts belong here, and Yad Vashem insisting that the last artworks of Bruno Schulz belong here, when in fact neither one of these artists had ever been here, of course. Neither one could be considered a Zionist in any, by any stretch. And yet there was a, the, an underlying uh, assumption that interested me, that somehow Jerusalem saw itself as the culmination of a story that began elsewhere. Uh, it's hard to think of more diaspora artists than these two figures. Um, and yet... Right. Somehow these these two figures, uh, one of whom died in 1924, were now in the centenary year of Franz Kafka. The second of whom that we're talking about tonight, Bruno Schulz, dies in 1942, neither of whom were around at the founding of the state in 1948. And yet there was this great insistence that they belong here. And so I became interested in both cases of sort of how um, both collectives like states and individuals uh, form a sense of belonging and attachment to, to writers and make posthumous claims on, uh, on two writers uh, and two artists who became far better known posthumously than they ever were in their, in their lifetimes. And you, uh, of course, you've written about both of them. You're particularly drawn to, are you particularly drawn to neurotic Jewish writers or is it just coincidence that <clears throat> both of them are? I don't believe in coincidence, so there must be something to it. Um, okay. It's I'm, I'm also hard pressed, and maybe this is why I have a block about what the next book is going to be. I'm hard pressed to find two more neurotic Jewish artists than these two. Uh, but if you find one, then um, perhaps you can let me know. And in the meantime, I would love to um, suggest that you yourself can write an essay uh, or a book, as a matter of fact, called From Paul to Picasso, My Journey to Artistic Belonging. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that under advisement. So let me ask you to kind of take us through, throw out some Im images to us and, and tell us the story that you have constructed in a book, by the way, which is also multiple in its title, right? An Artist, a Murder, and the Hijacking of History. So it's got a triple subtitle, doesn't it? And that's obviously the point. So I'd love to hear, we'd love to hear more about that. Well, I'll just um, maybe start by um, 
uh, starting a let's say let's say starting a dialogue with Bruno Schulz in 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 this way. Um, first of all, through the lens of multiple identities. So as you say, he was born a citizen of the Habsburg monarchy, and then he would, without moving from his hometown, which is called Drohobych, become the subject of the West Ukrainian People's Republic, the Second Polish Republic, the USSR briefly, and finally the Third Reich. And yet somehow, um, you know, to use a metaphor that he comes back to, he remained throughout something else. He remained a citizen of the Republic of Dreams. And I think for that, it meant two things. Um, he was on the one hand, uh, a master of, of imaginative fiction. Um, Isaac Beshevis Singer uh, called him one of the most remarkable writers who ever lived. And, and he said something like, you know, that um, Schultz, had he lived longer, uh, he, he wrote sometimes like Kafka, sometimes like Proust, and uh, sometimes reached depths that neither of those two reached. And that meant that um, after in, 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 in the afterlife of Schultz, um, he became really this kind of venerated spirit for a procession of, of modern writers. You mentioned Philip Roth, uh, Cynthia Ozick, uh, the Israeli writer David Grossman. Each of these people were weaving stories out of Schultz's private uh, mythology. Last year, I sat down for breakfast with the Nobel Prize winning Polish novelist Olga Tokarczuk. And she, she said, um, well, I, I love Schultz, but I also hate him because nobody could displace Schultz as the kind of supreme virtuoso of the Polish, la of the, of, of the Polish language. Um, he, he wrote the, the Polish language as if he had invented it. Um, but at the same time, he was something totally different. And that's what I want to foreground um, with you today mm -hmm. is, is that he yeah. was a graphic artist, right? And... Yeah. Um, uh, and he was a graphic artist whose drawings uh, at the end of his life caught the eye of a sadistic Nazi officer named Felix Landau. And literally, Schultz's art became the currency uh, in which he bought life. So what I want to do with you, Ori, and, and with all of you is sort of to, to, to talk for a moment about, to start at the end and to look at the last traces of Bruno Schultz's vanished world which uh, were these murals that Schultz was forced to paint for the children of that SS officer in Drohobych. Um, and, and those in murals... So, and in then, the nursery, yes. Yes, yes in, in precisely for the, for the children's room. And I'd like to um, <clears throat> draw up on screen, perhaps, uh, just a second. An, an image or two, so we can all get a sense of... Uh, My recollection that there was some subversion in some of those images as well, not so? That's right, that's right. So so um, this, uh, this officer uh, <clears throat> appropriated this house and, uh, and brought along his two children with him on this assignment to Drohobych, uh, ages two and four, and he uh, ordered Schultz to do a lot of things. But the last thing that he ordered Schultz to do was to draw, uh, to, to, to paint the walls of this uh, children's room. And um, they were lost uh, and covered over after the Second World War, when Drohobych became part of uh, Ukraine, it still is to this day. And uh, this, um, uh, this villa was apportioned to various, uh, you know, Ukrainian apparatchiks who knew nothing of Bruno Schulz. Um, and uh, let me stop sharing that for a moment. Um, and, th and then were miraculously rediscovered uh, in, in 2001. Uh, a word about that discovery, very briefly. It was discovered, uh, the murals were discovered by a, a pair of... Uh, 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 filmmakers from Hamburg, uh, Benjamin and Christian Geisler. I interviewed Benjamin Geisler, um, and and uh, they came in search. To, Father from, and stepson, to, correct? Right, right. Of yeah. of Schultz's last known artworks that were lost for decades behind the Iron Curtain, and now it's two thousand and one. Uh, and they're, according to what Benjamin Geisler told me, their motivation was quite interesting. Uh, it wasn't purely academic. Uh, the, the, the motivation for, for seeking out these murals was guilt. Um, Christian Geisler's father had been a convinced Nazi. 
And in trying to locate this last uh, document, if you will, of, of Schultz's suffering, their hope was somehow to atone for the family's sins. In other words, the discovery was made not for, by mere curiosity, but really by, by penance. So to make a long story short, they knock on the door of, of um, the Kaluzhny family, and uh, they find out that the children's room had been used for decades as a kitchen pantry. So they got permission from the Kaluzhny's, they took down the shelves, they took down the bottles of uh, pickles and garlic, and uh, they got a team of experts who were able to take off the outer layers of paint. And uh, the, one of the first things that, that emerged, as, as uh, we just saw, was this um, vigilant kind of blue helmeted driver holding the reins of a chariot. And that happens to be uh, the painter himself. It's, it's really the, the artist's last uh, self-portrait. Uh, and he was particularly renowned for his self-portraits, his portraits in general. But also, he did a lot of self-portraits, very interesting ones. So that's yeah, yeah. So let's. Uh, I'm going to pull and that again. Up. When you say Kalushny family, they're they're about seventy nine, eighty. They're an old couple, right? He's got right. cancer or something like that, and she's yeah. She comes to the door and just like, "What do you want from from me?" You know, kind of thing. That's right. right. That's right. Uh, so I'm going to pull up another image. <clears throat> A moment. All right. While I'm talking, we can look at this. This is one of the the the, the mural fragments. You can see they're sort of fairy tale scenes, right? Um, befitting a, a children's room. At the same time, there's a subversive element, which is that Schultz is putting his own face onto the chariot. He's putting the mistress of this SS officer, who is an especially cruel woman, in the face of um, of the witch. He's got these these gnomes. And as we're looking at this, um, I'll, I'll explain what happened. So, so the Geislers are, you know, this is a sensational find, the lost artworks of Bruno Schulz. They alert the press. <clears throat> they also alert various, um, the, you know, the culture ministry in Poland, the culture ministry in Ukraine. And then they made a sort of uh, uh, a notification that they would deeply regret. They notified Yad Vashem. Three months later, uh, and I had sources inside Yad Vashem who were able to uh, lead me in the right direction and confirm some of these things. Um, uh, three a Israeli agents went to Derhovich, uh, one of whom was an ex-KGB agent who uh, was now with the Mossad. And um, through uh, various, uh, let's say, spycraft, uh, a mixture of spycraft and, and bribery, they were able to get permission from the Kaluzhnys to literally chisel off five fragments of these murals down to the plaster, uh, bundle them up, um, put them in a car <clears throat> that um, could not be checked at the uh, Ukrainian-Polish border because it was under the diplomatic protection of then Israeli ambassador to Poland, Shevach Weiss. And uh, without any formal permission at all, they uh, spirited uh, these five fragments back to Yad Vashem. And you can imagine that all hell broke loose. Uh, it was not only in violation of, of several international uh, conventions, uh, but it, uh, it it resulted in, in eight years of negotiations. During those eight years, uh, Yad Vashem was not permitted to display these murals. They were in the storerooms downstairs. Uh, this is how one of the fragments, one of the five fragments looks now. Um, <clears throat> I'll stop sharing that for a and moment. Are those, were those straight lines, cut lines from when they had taken them off the wall, or is that part of the art? No, they. That's the way. That's exactly the way they 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 cut them off. Right. Um, so what I'd like to do is is sort of um, to use these competing claims, and by competing claims, I mean that Yad Vashem was claiming that essentially Schultz was, belongs in Yad Vashem because he was a victim of the Shoah, uh, that he was killed as a Jew. Uh, and uh, from the Polish perspective, uh, language is dispositive in the sense that Schultz wrote all of his books in Polish. Uh, that was a conscious choice. And uh, from the Ukrainian perspective, Durhobich is, is physically in, and geographically in, in Ukraine. <clears throat> 
So there are all these competing claims about um, to whom Bruno Schulz's artwork belongs. And what I try to do in the book is to um, sort of consider those competing claims as the ends of strings that can trace trace us back into Bruno Schulz's life and try, try to uh, allow us to understand sort of <clears throat> how he got to this children's room in the first place. Um, so let me say a word about uh, about Schultz's childhood, <clears throat> because um, he was born in 1892, but he hardly ever left, left this small town, Drohobich. Uh, childhood um, was imparted a special meaning by Bruno Schultz. Uh, he once said that if it were possible to turn back development, to kind of have a repeated childhood, uh, that would be what he called the realization of the of, of the age of genius or the realization of messianic times. And he said once, my ideal is to mature into immaturity. Uh, and I think that's reflected, uh, Ori, in both the visual art and the sense of wonder and the sense of blurring of boundaries that accompanies the uh, his literary art as well. Uh, and, and I think it's no co it's no coincidence if I could just if I could just add one more sure. thing that 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 Galicia was considered to be one of these borderlands right on the far eastern edge of the empire to which people in Vienna would would sort of you know this was a a far off poverty stricken province right um, part of what I want to say in my book is that to call Galicia a borderland is to adopt a gaze from the center right but for Schulz the borderland was the center. And he writes again and again, <clears throat> excuse me, about how his um, home province of Galicia was a place of fluctuating borders. <clears throat> and that's why it's no coincidence that at the heart of Schultz's art is a kind of blurring of borders. We have blurring of borders between animal and human, right? Um, he's got a metamorphosis story, just like Kafka had a metamorphosis story. There's a blurring of um, animate and inanimate. So he's got sort of mannequins who... Um, who come alive. Um, uh, so there's a lot of blurring of, bo of borders. And that's sort of, I think, um, really what comes out of um, the special meaning that he imparted to his childhood. And I'll just say one more word about um, about Drohovich. And during the time of Schultz's childhood, it was um, about 40% Jewish, 30% Catholic, Polish, and 30% Ukrainian. Um, and there were about um, 20 synagogues standing in this uh, small town. One of them, one of them I got to visit. Let me pull it's, it's, up. Yeah, yeah go, go ahead. ahead. <clears throat> I just wanted to pull up while, while you're, while you're thinking about the next question, I want to pull up another. No, uh, no I was just going to ask you about, or make two comments. And one is sort of a question and one is a comment. Of course, Picasso made the comment that an artist is someone who hasn't forgotten what it's like to be a child, because mm. that's what leaves your imagination free to, to create. Those who don't become artists are those who have grown up and forgotten what childhood was all about. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, because you have done so much work on both of them, Kafka wrote in German. He's, he's in a, a German-speaking minority within a Slavic majority, but he doesn't write in Czech, he writes in German, whereas Schultz writes in the language or the languages that are the majority. Um, and any thoughts on on the difference between them in that regard? Uh, let's say this: um, to write in those years in in Polish was a conscious choice, especially when, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Schultz's German was perfect. He wrote a short story in German that he sent to Thomas Mann. It's one of the great literary mysteries that, that has been lost, but he was corresponding with, with people like Thomas Mann. Uh, he was reading uh, in German. <clears throat> uh, and uh, there's a wonderful conversation about Schultz's language, really centers on Schultz's language, uh, which um, uh, took place <clears throat> between Philip in New York on the west side, between uh, Philip Roth and Beshevis Singer. 
And the Sheva singer says to Roth, he says, look, uh, I never heard of Bruno Schulz when I was in Poland. I only heard about him when I came to this country. Uh, the reason being was this great chasm, he's trying to get Roth to understand, the great chasm between uh, those Polish Jews who were writing in Polish and those Polish Jews who were writing in Yiddish. Uh, very, very rare was, was someone who could bridge those two worlds. And, you know, uh, Besheva Singer says something like, you know, Bill, you know, my my uh, fa father's family was in Poland for eight generations and my, fa and my father spoke precisely two words of Polish. Contrast that with um, the more assimilated uh, world of Bruno Schulz. Uh, and I think that gives you some, you know, sure. some idea of, of the conscious choice. I want to, before we go on a little bit more, just uh, show some more images. This one is uh, Schultz as a young man. Um, he went to uh, the high school, the gymnasium in Drohobich, <clears throat> after which he, like many Galician Jewish refugees, uh, spent most of the First World War in Vienna, where he studied some art. And when he uh, returned after the after the First World War from Vienna to Drohobich, uh, he got a job in the 1920s. Uh, I'll pull up another one, if I may. Uh, he got a job, um, just like Kafka had a day job and, and was miserable at his day job. Um, Bruno Schulz was uh, miserable at his day job. He got a job teaching arts and crafts <clears throat> at the very same high school that he had graduated from year, years earlier. Uh, this is a, a rare picture of Bruno Schultz seated, surrounded by his students. He's doing woodworking with them. Uh, he is, uh, yeah, essentially doing arts and crafts, draftsmanship, that kind of thing. And he writes letter upon letter about how uh, it's taking away his time from, from his own art. Um, and I was in uh, London, uh, what is it, three weeks ago for the London Jewish Book Week. And after I, uh, a talk I gave there, um, a, a elderly woman comes up and she's clutching um, a book that, <clears throat> that looks like this, a uh, very thick book um, of Bruno Schulz's drawings and etchings. And she says, my father was a student in that um in Bruno Schulz's class in that in that high school, and she's clutching wow. a Polish version, a Polish version of this book, which uh, is just full of of hundreds of uh, reproductions of Bruno Schulz's sketches. Um, and she confirms something that I had uh, until then only had from written records, which is that um, Schulz would captivate his students uh, by a telling. Uh, by telling stories, right? Elaborate, elaborate and improvised uh, stories. Um, <clears throat> and one of the one of the students said, yeah, he told st stories and even the Vilde Chayas, even the wild animals among us listen and um, and held us in rapt attention. Um, so he starts teaching. Meanwhile, uh, he becomes known first and foremost as an artist. And I think one way of interpreting um, Bruno Schulz is as uh, an artist who tried to translate his visual art into words rather than the other way around, right? Uh, you might even think of him as a kind of uh, Polish Jewish William Blake in that, in that respect. And so he becomes in the 1920s um, quite well known for his art and in particular for a... Uh, a book that was more or less self-published called The Book of Idolatry, 1924. And I want to show, I want to show us some images of that, if I may. Um, because what characterized uh, the book of idolatry. Yeah, let's show this one first, just a second. Um, is a couple of themes, but the most dominant theme, no pun intended, is is deep masochism. This is a fairly typical etching from this book of idolatry in which the the long-legged woman is the idol and the male groveling at her feet is the worshiper. Uh, sometimes they have what looks like books in the background, um, as in this one. Uh, and very often the women are kind of um, 
indifferent to the male gaze. Um, and this is something that really characterized uh, the early the early work of Bruno Schulz. I interviewed someone whose parents were from Drohovich who said, uh, yeah, he was very controversial. And uh, in my house, when we wanted to, we didn't even have to refer to his name. We just said the pornographer and everyone knew who we were talking about. Um, so he's got these, 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 these male idolaters who uh, are kind of in this uh, position of sublime surrender, right? Um, and at first he told his students, no, no, this is not mine. He, he claimed that these were, I'm just doing illustrations. I was commissioned to do illustrations for a Polish edition of Leopold von Sacher Masoch's famous uh, book, Venus and Furs. Um, but later he um, became less shy about it and uh, came to embrace this part of his artistic legacy. If I may, I'm going to show you another uh, rather typical uh, image from that same book in 1924. Second. <clears throat> Often with sort of uh, idealized the Rehobich cityscapes in the background. Sometimes the men uh, have faces that are quite similar, strikingly similar to Schultz's own. Sometimes they seem to be almost half animal in their, in their poses. <clears throat> and then I'll just, uh, I want to show one more before we, before we go on. Uh, and that is that um, really the story of Bruno Schultz has some, is, is a story that has a lot of absence in it, in the sense that there are many, many missing parts, many things that were lost or destroyed during the war. Of uh, the many, many paintings that Bruno Schultz uh, executed, uh, only one of them has survived to the present day. That's this one. It's called Encounter. Uh, <clears throat> And again, this posture of genuflection, of bowing to women who at best look over their shoulder, right? Mm. Um, one more thing as we have this up that I'll, I'll, re I'll relate is that this is not the only theme of Bruno Schulz's art. Um, they, uh, he also uh, has a, a wonderfully rich series of, um, of Jewish scenes, for example, groups of, of Jews around the Passover Seder table, uh, groups of Jews around, he gives them titles, so we know what they are. I mean, groups of Jews who are around, gathered around what looks like a village well awaiting the Messiah. Again, the messianic longing coming up. Um, so that's also an important part. I don't want to give the impression that it's only this masochistic uh, theme, but this is the one that really brought him to to great prominence. And as I as we mentioned before, it's it's one of the great ironies that um, this is happening in the 1920s, and uh, you know during the the Second World War, much much later, it's these very pieces that are catching the eye of a real life uh, sadist in the form of Felix Landau beyond um, Schultz's. How did Felix Landau come across him? How did he know what he could do so that he uh, uh, impressed him into artwork in his villa for his kid's nursery? One of the most um, <clears throat> difficult experiences I had in, in writing this book was not the archival research, and it was not... Uh, managing to to get into Drohobich before the war started and it was not knocking on doors and it was not um following uh leads into uh, how Yad Vashem sent secret agents for me the most difficult was uh, by which I mean emotionally difficult was uh, telling the story of this Felix Landau who was uh Austrian from Vienna uh so um 
it, it's it's quite possible to imagine that they would have crossed paths these two people in the first world war who was so brutal and such a sadist that his fellow ss officers wanted to uh, remove him from Vienna and sent him to this remote place in Drohobych, where he proclaimed himself the Judengeneral, the general of the Jews. Uh, and both he and his mistress, Trudy, uh, were exceptionally um, sadistic. And, and what's amazing about um, Felix Landau is that he, uh, he kept a diary, a wartime diary. And it makes for very difficult reading even today. Uh, <clears throat> it really got under my skin, I must say. Because it's sort of this mix between um, very uh, he, he's sort of whispering sweet nothings about Trudy, um, especially when they're when they're distant, when Trudy is back in Vienna or whatever, and uh, interspersing that with very matter of fact accounts of these mass shootings that he was uh, responsible for in the Bronitsa forest, just outside of Drohobych, and. Um, that's uh, it, it's quite incredible. I went to Drohobych in uh, November 2020, and uh, from my reading, I had the impression that the Bronitsa forest was very remote, you know, out in, in fact, it's like a 15 minute bus ride from the center of town to uh, the place where the, 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 the ditches where the mass shootings took place. It's, it's, it's extremely haunting. Not only did he keep a diary, um, but he, uh, unlike other uh, perpetrators, chose for whatever reason not to destroy it in 1945, and he kept it, and uh, it was used in the prosecution against him uh, in, I think it was 1961. Um, so uh, to get back to your, to your question, uh, we don't know precisely, but we do know from this diary that uh, Felix Landau considered himself to be a man of great taste, of refined taste. So every SS officer had their sort of pet Jew that they could give a, an armband, a necessary Jew armband to, that could afford them extra protection. Uh, one officer, for example, took a dentist as his pet Jew. Uh, another um, might take a... Uh, and Landau decided to take an artist. And it was well known in, I mean, he was, Bruno Schulz was the artist, very well known in Drohovich. It wouldn't have been hard for him uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to show up on, on Landau's radar. And that's in fact what happened. And uh, Landau ordered him to do portraits of of the, the Germans and the Austrian officers, but he also ordered him to paint the sides of a riding hall because Landau brought his horses and and the the SS casino and all these like very large scenes. Um, so yeah, it, it's the I mean I, I could I could uh, write an entire book just about this very strange relationship between the um, uh, masochistically inclined, uh, Jewish artist and the sadistically brutal um, Austrian uh, who thought of himself as as a person of of refined taste. Wow. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna pull up if I may, having having seen in the the painting. Uh, <clears throat> I want <clears throat> I want to get back to this issue of uh, absences for a moment. <clears throat> uh, and this is an anecdote that um, came up only after I, I'm writing the book. There there are several great absences in this story uh, and mysteries. One is a story in German, the only one that we know that Schultz wrote. Uh, it's not in Thomas Mann's archives. It's lost. More importantly, we know from letters that Bruno Schulz was at work at the time of the war on what was going to be his masterpiece, his first novel. Until then, he published two books of interlinked short stories, uh, but he worked for about 10 years on uh, sporadically on a novel. We know the title, The Messiah. Uh, <clears throat> he also writes in one of his letters that when he and his family were forced to move from their home into the Drohobych ghetto, he left uh, many of his artworks whole portfolios of his artworks, together with the only manuscript copy of the Messiah with uh, Catholic friends outside of the ghetto. It doesn't name them. And that uh, manuscript has never been found. I tried to track it down. 
Uh, I, I happen to believe it's in, uh, we know that the Red Army took back truckloads of archival material <clears throat> in late 1945. I happen to believe that it's somewhere in, in a mislabeled box in Moscow. Uh, <laughs> but um, the other absence besides the Messiah is <clears throat> uh, so many of his artworks, as I mentioned. Uh, now, I think, yeah, <clears throat> this one that you're looking at now is something that I mentioned in the book as a lost piece. I get an email after the book comes out. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and, -so, and um, I wanted to thank you for setting the scene so beautifully of Schultz drawing my great aunt, <clears throat> Madria Budratska. Uh, and you set the scene perfectly, you know, that he walks into a, Schultz walks into a house and he sees Maria, a very beautiful young woman, and he says, please hold that pose with your legs crossed. I'll draw you just like that. Uh, and then my correspondent says, but I have to make a correction. Uh, you number this among the many lost works uh, of Bruno Schultz, and it's true that it's not in the catalog raisonne anywhere. <clears throat> but I want to tell you that it's hanging on the wall of my living room in Beverly Hills. And he sends me this uh, snapshot, which is, um, uh, I believe, tonight is the first time that it's being publicly shown. And it's just, it's, it's just uh, extraordinarily beautiful to my mind, beautiful uh, image, both in the in the foreground and in the imagined background. So that's just one example of how things uh, from Schultz are still to this day coming up in in auctions, um, and there there are there are pieces of the puzzle yet to be discovered, shall we say? Can you tell us? I'm worried about time, and I want to make sure at least to get to two things and anything else and everything else you want, but at least two things. One about his fiance, his co-translator co of Kafka's The Trial, and second, of course, his death. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> let's start briefly with uh, Josefina uh, Zelinska. Um, they uh, discovered the, uh, a shared love of uh, Rilke, the German poet. They read Rilke and Kafka and Thomas Mann together. Um, Josefina was a school teacher, uh, and together they uh, translated um, Kafka's The Trial, came out in 1936. Uh, he was already quite well known at the time, so uh, although she did the bulk of the work, unfairly he got the, he got, he got the credit. Uh, but I want to read something from there afterward to that uh, classic translation. Um, he says this, uh, and I think this, this speaks to your earlier question about the, the affinities between them. Um, Kafka writes, Bruno Schultz, is able to render the atmosphere of a human life coming into contact with the superhuman, with the highest truth. And the Kafka's perceptions are not his exclusive property. They're the common heritage of the mysticism of all times and of all nations. Uh, Kafka, this is Schultz continuing, sees the realistic surface of existence with unusual precision, but these to him are but a loose epidermis without roots, which he lifts off like a delicate membrane and fits onto his transcendental world, which he grafts onto his reality. That's the most beautiful description of, of Kafka's style that I've ever read. The idea that, that reality is uh, something that, that Kafka um, is on the one hand extremely realistic um, and extremely precise in both content and form, but, um, but in, in the metaphor of Bruno Schultz, that surface is like an epidermis, which he can almost lift off with the, with the scalpel of his prose and fit onto something more transcendental, as if you can take that surface and graft it onto um, a different reality. And that's just a beautiful thing. Um, I, I'll just say that Josefina, uh, so, so one more affinity is that, um, as you well know, uh, Kafka twice broke his uh, uh, engagement with, with Felice Bauer. And uh, Bruno Schulz was no more lucky uh, in, in, in his, let's say, matrimonial quest. And he too, he and Josefina broke, broke their relations. 
Yosefina survived, uh, moved to Gdansk, and never forgot. She she kept. Uh, she lived uh, into her nineties, and she always kept like the Bruno Schulz flame. She kept many of his letters, um, which is why we today have many of those letters. She never uh, had another relationship after Bruno Schulz. Uh, Schulz did have other uh, very close female relations uh, that I discuss in the book. One of whom was um, someone who's getting attention as we speak, renewed attention, very welcome attention. That's that's the Yiddish uh, Polish modernist poet Devora Fogel. She yes, has yes. new translations now in both English and now in French. Uh, well worth reading. Devora Fogel, so there was this kind of um Devora Fogel was part of the Warsaw literary crowd with Rochel Auerbach, who later became famous with the Ringelblum archive. And um I'll just say in one sentence that Vogel Auer, and Auerbach were instrumental in getting uh, Schulz published and get, making his name for himself in in Warsaw. Uh, and now, now to the to the death. To maybe it's an appropriate place to 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 to, to end at least the formal part of the conversation. Um, there was. Uh, <clears throat> November 19th, 1942, was the very day that Schultz had finally, after much hesitation, planned to escape the Dorobich ghetto with forged papers. Something, by the way, that Rachel Auerbach did successfully uh, a bit later from the Warsaw ghetto, and it was still possible to do. Uh, and friends were urging him to do this, and he was always hesitating because I think he felt, if you ask me, that Drohovich was essential to uh, his creative life, to nourishing his creative life. Um, I also think that um, he imagine, and maybe we'll speak about this um, with some questions later, but uh, this, uh, I, I tried to put myself in the, in the shoes of Bruno Schulz, who was um, coerced to paint. In other words, coerced to use his creative energies for this very dark, purpose. He had no choice, right? And that got me into thinking about what is coerced art? How can we compare, let's say, these murals with which we began today to the art that he did of his own free creative motions of the soul? And how terrible it must have been to have no artistic outlet except that which you are ordered to do uh, to preserve your life, right? It's not It's not only forced labor. It's forced labor of a particularly insidious kind if you're an artist for whom everything, for whom art is your life, as it was for Bruno Schulz. Uh, just today I had a conversation with someone who's writing about a cantor in Munich um, who in August 1938 uh, together with his community, was forced by the German occupation to dismantle their own shul, their own synagogue. And I thought, this is a metaphor. This is what Landau was forcing Schulz to do, in a way, to dismantle that which is most is closest to your heart and that which you've spent so much of your spiritual energy trying to create. So on the very day, on this, on this uh, November day, um, on the very day that he had planned finally to escape, um, earlier that, that November, Felix Landau had shot a Jewish dentist who had been under the so-called protection of one of his colleagues named Carl Ginter. And there was this kind of um, wild action on the streets that day. And uh, Carl Ginter apparently spotted Bruno Schulz in the street and not a hundred yards from the house where Schulz was born and shot him. Um, Bruno Schulz was 50 years old, and apparently uh, there are several versions of this, but one version, which is in a sense the most horrible, is that that afternoon, Gunther caught up with uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Felix Lando, and said, you killed my Jew, I've killed yours. What we know is that um, when night fell, Bruno Schulz's body was still in the street. He was still wearing that necessary Jew armband that um, Felix Landau had given to him. Um, and uh, we don't know where he's buried. There is no Bruno Schultz grave. The only thing that exists in Dorovich today is a small brass plaque 
uh, on the sidewalk uh, at the place where he was um, shot. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is that I discovered when I went to Drohobich and there was an ecumenical service um, at the anniversary of his death, uh, that that plaque is a replica because the original was stolen, pried up from the sidewalk, and the police found that the culprit uh, was actually an illiterate thief who wanted to melt down the brass. And so what we have now is not even the original uh, plaque at the place of uh, this this uh, horrible murder, but a, a copy. The, the plaque has been broken up. And that's maybe a, yeah, a, a, a metaphor for, for this whole thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to say. Um, I've, this is only enough time to to sort of give a, a small appetizer, um, including like the the whole ethical dimensions of uh, where Schultz belongs. But I, I want to close with one more quote, if I may, Ori, and then we can go to questions. Um, in December, I was surprised that um, I saw a picture of Bruno Schultz in the New Yorker magazine. I want to pull that up because it's the most famous picture of Schultz, and we haven't come across it yet. Um, <clears throat> it's Schultz uh, in the mid thirties on the steps of his home in Der Hobich, which still exists. That's that. Uh, <clears throat> I interviewed the son of the photographer. the the father the, the photographer Bertolt Schenkelbach was a friend of Schultz, um, and. Um, I was so I I opened up the the New Yorker uh, December twenty fifth edition and I saw this this photograph and uh, I start reading the article and it's by a um, a wonderful um, staff writer named Catherine Schultz I known I've known her by byline for a long time but because Schultz is a relatively common name I didn't think to con to connect it and the whole essay starts with my book and says well um, I may be the last living relative of Bruno Schultz who himself had no children. It's probable that I'm the relative of, um, I'm a descendant of his older brother. But I want to close with um, the last paragraph of that piece in The New Yorker. Um, Schultz writes, um, Bruno Schultz's work belongs to the world, to anyone anywhere who loves his stories. That relationship of delight and even identification is available to everyone, regardless of nationality, religion, or lineage. And that's perhaps the most beautiful thing literature and art can do to forge a kinship across identities unbound by space or time. Fantastic. Thank you so very much, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's I imagine great. there are still, there's some questions, Rachel, and I think we have some time. I mean, I know our time is up, but it doesn't have to end. Exactly. Well, we'll just uh, have a very Take a few. brief few questions okay. and, uh, a few about the you know where where things are like uh where is the um diary of Felix Landau? You said uh, Benjamin that it uh he didn't destroy it. Where is it kept? Has it been published? What is the story with that diary? It has since been published. I don't know where the original is, but it could be in Yad Vashem. Uh, what I do know is that uh, the uh, one of one of the children of Felix Landau was interviewed for a German documentary program, and he admitted that although he's known about the diary, the existence of the diary, his entire life, uh, he couldn't bring himself to read it until he was fifty years old. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it has it has since been been published. Was was Landau's wife in Vienna the whole time? I'm presuming. No, she was back and forth. She spent a lot of time um, with him in Drohovich, and I, I, I also spoke to people um, who, uh, uh, well, one family whose mother was forced to be a kind of housemaid domestic in Villa Landau, and uh, told me horrifying stories about her cruel, her own cruelty as well. Um, Sister. Yeah. Wow. So now let me and and just to to to, yeah. to Rachel's uh, other question, I'll say that you know when when <clears throat> part of the dilemma over the um, what to do with the murals 
has to do with the fact that uh, only only five fragments were taken, but others were left right in mm -hmm. place. Smaller fragments were left in place, and those fragments, and I'll show you the uh, photograph of one of them now. Those fragments are now uh, in the Drohobich City Museum. Mm. So it's, mm. it's it's currently not possible to see all of these murals uh, together in a single in a single place. Um, these are are two smaller fragments. I think one is more or less like a Hansel and Gretel scene um, mm. that were left, you know, on the on the walls and uh, yeah. So basic, basically, Benjamin, these uh, these um, agents uh, came in and with a with a hammer and took off parts of the morals and um, basically the and and then the city came and took uh, took parts of the wall. Um, so how about the the villa and how about the family who lived there? Like basically, they are at least a w one room in their in their um house was completely being destroyed right what like what happened with that um yeah i went there um it's today still a private um private residence and uh, the the, the kalushni family so there were about three months in between the discovery of the murals that scene that i showed at the beginning of them taking off the outer layers of paint and the um uh, chiseling off of the murals and spiriting them back to Jerusalem. In the intervening three months, um, there were certain ideas that uh, that that the Kalushnis would agree to be moved to a nicer apartment, and that that apartment would be used as a kind of um, Bruno Schulz gallery and reconciliation center. Now, keep in mind that the Rubbish today is um, very homogenous. It's nothing like the multi-ethnic polyglot city that it once was. And this is also a point that this case raises, for me at least. We can, we can speak of repatriation. And many of the speakers that have been on your series, uh, that, that, that's a term, right? A term of art, you might say. What happened, this, this, is, a, this is a case that makes us think about what happens uh, to the idea of repatri repatriation when there's no more patria, that patria doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There's a name Drohobich, but Drohobich today is a Ukrainian city through and through that uh, did not have much interest in uh, Bruno Schulz until this discovery in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of the point, right? That Yad Vashem said, we are the proper protectors of this heritage. Uh, one of the statements from Yad Vashem is, look, Yad Vashem gets almost 2 million visitors a year. This was prior to COVID. Um, and um, where are more people going to see the, the last murals of Bruno Schulz? Mm -hmm. in, in, in this uh, town in Western Ukraine that had uh, neglected him his memory for so long or in Yad Vashem, right? Um, so... Uh, this whole idea of repatriation changes its accent a little bit when the, the patria really no longer exists. The, 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 the Drohobich has nothing in common of today, has nothing in common with the Drohobich of Bruno Schulz until, uh, except for, for the name. One of the welcome um, results of this 2001 scandal was that uh, a group of uh, wonderful scholars in Drohobich said, hey, wait a minute, we want to mark the memory and legacy of Bruno Schulz here. And that's why they started every two years a Bruno Schulz festival. I attended, as I mentioned, the 2021. David Grossman attended, uh, I think, the 2018 one. Olga Torkarchuk has been three or four times. It's a wonderful uh, event where Schulzologists come from all over the world. The, the Japanese translator of Schulz comes from Tokyo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they all gather there. And that's a direct result of this rediscovery. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. I want to show one more, um, Rachel and Ori, one more <clears throat> image that I can't resist showing um, because finally there was an agreement signed, and this is really the the bringing the, the, the story full circle. There was an agreement signed uh, in 2009 after much negotiation between Ukraine and Israel that they would allow... Um, 
these murals to be on permanent loan, as they call them. Am I sharing screen? Hold on. And by chance, one of the first visitors to Yad Vashem that week was um, Secretary of State um, Hillary Rodham Clinton. And Yad Vashem uh, said, oh, do you want to see the Bruno Schultz murals? And this was the, the photo op. This is the, the photo op that they used at Bruno Schultz um, to launch the exhibition. You know, So speaking about giving the ways in which we give political legitimation to uh, artistic heritage, this is a pretty obvious uh, example of doing so. <laughs> Very true. Uh, Benjamin, are they are they always on display these these morals at Yad Vashem or are they? Yes, back yes. The they're they're on permanent permanent display in the art wing of Yad Vashem. Okay, okay, that's that's good to hear. That's great. Um, yeah, I think. Um, Especially your last thoughts are, I think, very, very important to think about patria, what, what is repatriation and where do things belong, um, and leaves us with uh, some food for thought, for sure. Um, Ori, do you have any conclusion? No, I just think it's, uh, this was a terrific presentation. And uh, in that last realm of repatriation, of course, uh, the distinction between something that comes from a country or a city and something that comes from a family and how one distinguishes the issue of restitution from repatriation and so on and so forth. There's something else that we have and can and should consider as we move forward. But uh, no, otherwise, just to thank Benjamin for such a beautiful, beautiful and enriching presentation. And I'm sure that both Bruno and Franz are looking down not smiling because that would not be appropriate, but but uh, frowning at you joyfully and thankfully. So they, both, they both had a wonderful sense of humor. I, I yeah. think they, and a wonderful sense of irony. I think they would have appreciated the ironies in this, yes. in these posthumous posthumous claims. A absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <That's so true. laughs> thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, Pleasure. very much, and uh, Ori. Also, this was. Uh, sure very amazing and multi multi-dimensional presentation thank you so much Great. all best bye, bye.